All right, so this is Chapter 3, Federalism, video lecture. Our learning objectives for, for this chapter are describe the three basic forms of governmental structures, which is federalism, unitary, and confederacy, identify the ways in which the Constitution determines the powers of state and national governments, evaluate how constrain, const, I'm sorry, contrasting interpretations of the Supremacy Clause and the Tenth Amendment have led to a divergent views in, of the scope of state and national powers, be able to describe how the Supreme Court has set forth the principle of implied powers in McCulloch v. Maryland, and understand the relationship of implied powers to enumerated powers, describe how the Civil War and Civil Rights Movement has contributed to the development of national supremacy over the states, list and analyze the clause in the Constitution that define the obligations each state has to every other state, be able to trace the ways in which American federalism has changed over the past two centuries, Compare the contrasting forms of dual federalism and cooperative federalism. Describe what is meant by fiscal federalism and assess the role that federal money plays in state policies. And that's it. Those are the learning objectives from this chapter. So just to give you a review, not review, but an overview of this, this chapter, uh, the relationship among the federal and state and national government have, have can or has can and often has confused people, yet federalism is at the heart of of critical battles over the nature and scope of public policy in the United States. Neighborhood schools are run by local elected school boards, but they also receive state and national funds, and with those funds come state and national rules and regulations. So understanding the scope of and nature of the local, local, state, and national governments is thus critical to learning about the development of public policy in the United States. So first, let's define what federalism is. Um, federalism is a system of organizing governments. A system of organizing governments. There are different systems of organizing governments. America has a federal system of government. So what federalism is, is a way of organizing nations so that there are two or more levels of government. And both of these levels of government form, have a formal authority over the same area and people. For example, there is a state, there, there are national there's a federal state, sorry, there's a federal income tax, I'm trying to say. And there's also, some states have state income tax. So that's two different levels of government that have formal authority over the same area and the people. So, for example, Washington, the state of Washington, they have a state income tax. They have formal authority over the people of Washington to tax them, just like the national government has authority to tax everyone in America. So federalism, two more levels of government that have power. Uh, there's only 11 nations that actually have a federalism system, a government or organization of government, and most countries have what's called a unitary system of government, which is where the power resides in the central government, and it's kind of a top-down scenario where the top central national government tells the, the local state governments what to do. So that's the most common form of system is unitary. And the third type of system is called a confederation. And in a confederation, the national government is weak and most of or all the power is in the hands of its components or states. Um, the states can tell the national government what to do. And this is what our government was when we had the Articles of Confederation as our ruling constitution at the time. We had a confederate system of government. So those are the three types of system of governments any country can have, and this is under any um, form of government. You can have a confederate system of government in a uh, dictatorship. Um, actually, that probably wouldn't work. You couldn't do that. That would be totally weird. But what I'm trying to say is you can have any form of government. We can, we can have a democracy with a unitary government system. So the system just kind of goes correlates with the form of government you have. All right, and the workings of the American system are, it's sometimes called intergovernmental relations because it's referring to the interactions among national, state, and local governments. We don't just have a straight division between these national, state governments. They, they intermingle, they work with each other, which is called intergovernment relations, this relationship between all different levels of government. They do blend together. Um, so why is federalism important? There are two reasons why this is important. Federalism system, it decentralizes our policies and it decentralizes um, our politics. 
So this is why it's important, and we're going to talk about how, how it does this um, later on in this lecture here. Okay, the con what's the basis of con uh, the federalism in the Constitution? Well, no word, in, no word federalism is actually mentioned in the Constitution itself, but you had 18th century Americans at the time of the Constitution being written, they had little experience in thinking of themselves as Americans first and states second. Most people at this time um, thought of themselves as a state citizen rather than American or um, um, yeah, or American. They didn't think of those. They saw this as more of a um, New Yorker compared to a United States citizen. So, this idea of division of power was not what people they were, they didn't think of it that way. There was not people thinking that way. Um, most common Americans at the time. So, federalism federalism is a division of power. The writers of the Constitution carefully define what those powers are for the states and the national governments. Which you can find in you know Article One, Two, and Three defines the powers of uh, the national government, and I believe Article Four. Well, the Bill of Rights basically says, I'm sorry, the, the Tenth Amendment basically says um, any power not given to the the national government, although the powers are reserved for the states. So they define what the state powers are too, just in Amendment um, Ten of the Constitution. So. Although favoring a strong, stronger national government, states have retained and still are a vital component of government, even though we do have a stronger national government. And that's the whole basis of the Constitution itself, was to create a stronger national government. Because under the Articles of Confederation, with a Confederate system, um, there was a lot of problems that states couldn't actually resolve, so they wanted a stronger national government. But still, states are still vital to today. Um, the Supremacy Clause deals with this question of which government should prevail in disputes between states and the national government. And if you look at Article 6, it says that there are, th there are three, three items in which, there, in which the supreme law of the land is the supreme law of the land. And one of those in instances or items that supreme law of the land is the Constitution. You know, no state law is above the Constitution. No state law or local law is above um, federal laws laws of the national government as long as they're consistent with the Constitution and lastly no state or local law is above a treaty which can only be made by the national government um, president can sign treaties with the consent of Senate so those three items alone the according to the Constitution those three items are the supreme law of the land nothing's above them now the Constitution is above national law as long well until the law gets as long as the law falls on the constitution and same thing with the treaties constitution is basically the, is where the buck stops so judges in every state they are they are specifically bounded by the constitution they must they must refer to the constitution um, when they make rulings because that is the supreme law of land and whenever there's questions that are, that are if there's ever questions remain, or I'm sorry, questions ever concerning the boundaries of the national government's powers and the state national government's powers, um, the national government can only operate within its appropriate sphere, and they can't overstep the state's powers. And this is what the Tenth Amendment says. You know, the Tenth Amendment say, states that power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. So any power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, it's reserved for the states or by the people. Um, so when, when it comes to operating and which, which sphere is more, par more powerful, according to the Tenth Amendment, this is the contrast between the Supremacy Clause and Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says it's reserved for the states. The Supremacy Clause says um, any disputes between the state and national government, these laws are superior. So that's the conflict between these two um, writings of the Constitution. And who ultimately decides what the Constitution means? Well, it's judges of the Supreme Court. And there have been variations in the court's interpretation of what the Tenth Amendment means and says and what, what does that mean for the states? Who has more? Who, what, who prevails when it comes to a state versus national issue? And uh, that's their job. That's what they do. That's what they, they interpret what the Constitution means or says. So the national government has 
been establishing a national supremacy from the very beginning of um, our nations, actually. But there are, there are four significant events that have largely settled this issue of how the national state powers are related and who has more power over the other. And these four key events are is McCulloch versus Maryland case, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause, which was in Gibbons versus Ogden case, and the Civil War and Civil Rights Movement. So the first event is McCulloch versus Maryland, which is over, which is about um, U.S. National Bank and um, taxing banks within your state. But um, the case. This is the first time this case, this issue was brought up before um, before the courts. The issue of state versus national power. First time was that was brought to brought before the Supreme Court, and in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the national policies take precedence over state policies. So this is this this is the beginning of the establishing the national government as being nationally superior to states. Um, they ruled that the national policies take precedent over state policies. And Chief Justice Marshall wrote that the government of the United States, though limited in its power, is supreme within its sphere of action. And because it says the, um, it the power to regulate commerce, they were the the, the court um, sided with the the national government in that case. Um, the court also ruled that the Constitution gives Congress certain implied powers, based on the provisions granted Congress the power to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution with forging powers. So that that goes beyond the enumerated powers that are specifically listed in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Powers that are, powers that are implied go along with these enumerated or expressed powers in the Constitution. So um, this case is very important because it expanded the national supremacy of the national government by stating that national policies take precedent and Congress has implied powers that go along with their enumerated powers. Okay, the second key event to establishing national supremacy is the court's interpretation of the, of the Commerce Clause. And in the case of Gibbons v. Ogden, which is about um, trade across state lines, uh, New York, New Jersey, um, the Supreme Court expanded the Congress's power to regulate interstate and international commerce by broadly defining commerce. To incorporate every form of commercial activity, and this is where the healthcare gets gets its legs from being constitutionally because of Congress's, I'm sorry, of the Supreme Court's definition of what commerce means. What does regulate interstate and international commerce mean? Um, so you can say that healthcare is a is a definitely a commerce or a trade or a business, and because of that. They have Congress has a power to regulate that. Some argue they don't. Some say they do. Ultimately, the Supreme Court will decide if it's constitutional or not. And the third event is civil war, um, which settled militarily the issue that the McCulloch versus Maryland case brought. Um, so, which so the issue that. Who has more power? Or who has more say? State or national power? This was fought out in the Civil War. States wanted, southern states wanted to keep their slaves. Northern states didn't want to. The national policy was to get rid of them all together. So who won out? Well, we had to actually go to war to figure out who would win. And ultimately, the, the national government won and um, put the southern states in 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 check, basically. And the last key event is the Civil Rights Movement. Um, a century. After um, the Civil War, the policy issue shifted from from not just state versus national powers, but equality amongst the states and national government. So, policy issue was about equality, and not just who has power, but do, does equality mean for everyone? National governments say yes, some states say no. So, the issue was equality. And in 1954, the Supreme Court held that school segregation was unconstitutional. And this is in Broad, Brown versus Board of Education. Schools can no longer segregate it based on this, based on the national government's interpretation of the law, and um, states had to uh, oblige. They had to change the way they did things, and if they didn't, they were going to face consequences. So again, establishing the, this is establishing the national supremacy, um, and then federalism 
also involves more than just the relationships between national and state governments. Um, Article 4 of the Constitution outlines certain obligations that each state has to, er to each other as well. So one of these obligations the states have towards each other is called the full faith and credit. Um, this is where states are required to give full faith and credit to the public acts, records, and civil judicial proceedings of every other state. So an example of this is if I had to pay child support for the child I do not have, and I not divorced, but if I were to get divorced and had, if I did have a child and I moved away to uh, the state of California, I still have to pay child support that was rendered in a court case in my divorce. You know, I had to pay X amount of dollars for child support. Just because I move away doesn't mean I, it doesn't apply to me anymore. So full faith and credit is, um, again, requiring states to, um, uh, to um, uh, what's the word? I don't know the word I'm thinking of, but basically to not ignore, not ignore other public acts, records, or civil judicial proceedings from other states. The third one is, or sorry, the second one is extradition. States are required to return a person charged with a crime to the other state at the, for that state trial or imprisonment. So wherever you commit the crime and you run away, your are caught in state, you must be returned back to the state to face those charges brought to you in that state, not the state you're caught in, extradition. And the last one here, privileges and immunity. Citizens of each state receive all the privileges and immunities of any other state in which they happen to be in. So I don't get taxed more because I travel to another state just because I live in Nevada, I don't get taxed more. I might get pulled over more often because I have out of state plates, but um, I don't I'm treated the same way as if I was in same way I was in Nevada if I was in California. Um, there are exceptions to this. For instance, when you go off to college you may go to a college outside the state of Nevada and because of that you may have to pay um, out of state tuition. That doesn't apply to this privileged immunity that's because state colleges are designed for the people of that state and if you wanted to go to it you may have to pay extra for that so there are ex um, um, exemptions to some of these obligations states have with each other alright so that's how states relate with each other let's look at intergovernment relations today so how do how do these governments national state and local governments how do they intermingle and how do they relate um, with each other all together so our nation has gone from a what's called dual federalism to a cooperative federalism and what dual federalism is is a form of federalism in which states and national governments each remain supreme within their own spheres it's also called a layered cake federalism meaning the national government stays in their fear of chocolate cake and the state governments stay within their fear of white cake. They're totally divided, they're separate, and within those spheres they're able to operate and do what they need to do without each other being in each other's way. So dual federalism. Cooperative federalism is a form of federalism with mingled responsibilities and blurred distinctions between the levels of government, between national and state governments. This is also this is known as marble cake federalism. So, where dual federalism there's are separate, cooperative federalism has have them, has them working together, and sometimes it becomes so blurred that you don't know who to go to or who to turn to or who's responsible for certain action. The American federal system has leaned towards a dual federalism before the national government began to assert its dominance so over time our government has the national government has become more and more dominant in in the relationship with the states and has become more influential over the states and we started off as a, more of a dual federalism a layer cake federalism and over time we have become more of a cooperative federalism where the national government has more of a more of a say into what local league takes place, what policies are going to be in states or local um, governments, which is a marble cake federalism. So, how do they do this? How does how does the national government become dominant? How do they how do they blend themselves within the state governments? Well, one way is through is through fiscal federalism. This pattern of spending, taxing, and providing grants in the federal system. So, whenever the national government provides money grants to a state or local government, they are 
they were cooperating together and mingling responsibilities and it's going to have a huge will have a huge influence on states itself and this is a cornerstone fiscal federalism is the cornerstone of national government's relations with the state local governments um, one way they do this is what how do they how do they build this relationship or how do they create this relationship is through grants and aids which are the, it's the main instrument which the government, national government uses for both aiding and influencing states' localities. All right, there are two major types of aid that can be given to states and local and local governments. Um, one is categorical grants, which is a more specific type of grant or um, aid to a state. It's very specific. It um, is detailed. And... Um, State and local agencies can ab can obtain category grants only by applying for them, and these category grants come with numerous strings or rules and requirements attached to them. And um, if certain local or state laws that are not passed, then the federal guidelines are and or if the federal guidelines are not met, then you may not get these grants. You may not get get this aid if you don't follow the rules that are set forth. So there's a lot of strings attached to them, and within the category grant, there are two types of type types of category grants. You have one type is a project grant, which is the most common type of category grant. It's awarded to a state or local government based on competitive applications, um, such as grants to university professors from the National Science Foundation. They can be based on how competitive or how good their application was. So project grants, most common type of category grants, it's based on competition. The other type is a formula grant which is distributed according to a formula, states and local governments automatically receive funds based on a formula developed on factors such as population. It's not all of it could be one or one or all of these. Population, per capita, income, percentage of rural population. And some examples of formula grants is Medicare, aid for families with dependent children, or public housing. So categorical grants are very specific for a certain um, purpose and they come with strings attached and there's two types of them it's either going to be awarded based on your competition or a formula set forth by the government. The second type of federal aid to a state or local government is called block grants and block grants are used to support broad programs in areas like community development and social services. Um, these types of grants are less cumbersome, have less cumbersome paperwork and restrictions by the federal government attached to them and Congress has established block grants to support very broad programs. So a category of grant would be like money to to education in the state of Nevada um, in the Washoe County School District for computers. Very detailed. A block grant would be money to the state of Nevada for education and However, the state of Nevada wants to use that money for education, they can give it all to Washoe County or Washoe School District. Or they can give it all to Clark County School District or whatever, or the rural area school districts. It's all up to them. It's based, it's however they feel like it can be best used. So states have discretion in deciding how much to spend the money or where to spend the money. And on the whole, federal grant, the federal grant just distribution follows the principle of universalism which is something for everybody even though some money goes where it's not really needed um, everybody's gonna get something there are some occasions where when states would prefer not to receive federal aid such as when Congress extends a program that is administered by the states and only partially funded by the national government this is called an underfunded mandate which means that the states have to budget more funds for the project in order to receive federal grant money so if you want to get money from us, you get a fun part of it, which could be a, an extra burden on the state. And of even greater concern to states are what's called an unfunded mandates. These require state and local governments to spend money to comply with laws such as, uh, for example, the Clean Air Act of 1970, which state every, you know, say this, every state has to have pollution levels at a certain level, or the Americans with Disability Act of 1990, uh, with no financial help at all from the federal government. To enact these laws, the government didn't help give them any any money, a drop of money to help implement the laws that are passed. Um, 
so those are unfunded unfunded mandates and sometimes so sometimes these mandates or these these this aid given to states or local localities is not a good thing it doesn't want they don't really want to take it they may not want to take it at all okay understanding federalism by decentralizing the political system federalism has was has been is designed to contribute to the limited form of democracy supported by the founders of the of our um, nation um, there are advantages to having a federalism system one advantage is different levels of government provide more opportunities for participation in politics um, I can participate at the national level or the local level or state level or city level or the county level many opportunities to participate I can vote in all the different levels of government I can protest at different parts different parts I can go to Washington DC or I can go to Carson City so provide more opportunity to participate additional levels of government contribute to democracy by increasing access to government there are multiple levels of government I can go to I can go to my mayor and go to my city councilman I can go to my county commissioner I can go to my governor I can go to president um, more levels of government to um, have more access to government two levels of government increases the opportunity for government to be responsive to the demands of policies so if there's, because there's two levels there the demand is to fix health care it can be fixed at the state or local level um, a party that loses strength at the national level can rebuild and groom leaders at the state level meaning that if you lose if the, the Republicans lose power in the national level they can maybe win power at the at the state level, maybe they, they have more Republican governors than, the, than Democratic governors throughout America. So there's different levels they can they can win at different parts of, of levels of government. Uh, number five is possible for diversity of opinion within the country to be reflected in the different public policies among different states. So just because our nation's huge and every state is basically a, a different as a science lab, and the diversity of opinion within each state is a good thing and different states are going to try different things different policies to try to make their state better than the others and sometimes these policies that get that get implemented are going to work its way up to the national government for example health care um, Massachusetts passed a law years ago mandating everyone to have health insurance and lo and behold um, today we have a same law nationally so diversity of opinion um, can be a good thing because it reflects different. Um, you have different public policies among the different states, which show maybe what can help other states see what's what right, what works, and what doesn't work. And the last advantage, handling by handling most disputes over policies at the state level, state or local level, federalism reduces decision making at the national level, which it could be a good thing as well. The bad side, the disadvantages of federalism, the quality of service like education is heavily dependent. Um, on the state in which the service is provided, so states differ, and some states differ, and the, the resources they offer can um, make some states, you know, have better education than over the others, which is the case in America. Uh, diversity policy can discourage states from providing services that would otherwise be available in another state. So just because I was provided the same service in Nevada, I mean, I'll get the same service in another state I go to. Um, Fellows may have a negative effect on democracy when local interests are able to impede national majority support of certain policies. So an idea at a local level makes its way up to the national level and then it affects everyone in America. It may not be a good thing for everyone in America. And last one here, the number of local governments makes it difficult for many Americans to know which government is responsible for certain functions. So it's good that there's so many different levels of government to go to, you have access to, but it's also bad because you may not know where to go to, to um, have someone fix your your issue. All right, and then lastly, federalism and the growth of national government. How's how's the national government grown due to federalism? Um, the national government took a direct interest in e economic affairs from the very beginning, the very founding of our republic. That's the reason why they wrote the constitution, because the economy was not doing well and needed a stronger national government to help regulate the economy. So, this growth of national government has started from the very beginning of the of the constitution. Um, as the United States has changed from an agricultural to an industrial nation, new problems have arose, and with those problems, have there have been new demands for government action to take place. 
which is expansion of government as well, but just overall. And as the United States has moved from a system of dual federalism to one of a cooperative federalism, in which the national and state governments share responsibility for public policies, share responsibility for public policy has taken place um, because of that, this cooperative federalism, this uh, marble cake federalism. So what does this mean for us, the scope of the national government? The national government's share of expenditures has grown rapidly since 1929 till today, and today the government spends about 20% of the gross domestic product, while the state spends about 11%. And the growth of the national government has not supplanted the states. So despite the fact that the national government has gotten bigger and bigger and more dominant um, over the states, they're still not irrelevant. States are still not irrelevant. And that's it for uh, Chapter 3, Federalism. Here are your key terms. And with that, I'm done.